that you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that he is Lord. That's the step. Then what? Then he, salvation comes. And he says, you shall be saved. So it's, again, understanding scripture. Jeremiah Hawkins actually posted a thing this week. And it was kind of funny um, because people misquote scripture a lot. Uh, and he put on there, you know, that the money is the root of all evil. No, the love of money is the root of all evil. Again, so people take things, either they take scripture out to have it fit what they want it to say, or they flip-flop the scripture to also make it fit what they want it to say. What? Because it sounds better. I can draw more people in. I can manipulate things, mm -hmm. right? So <clears throat> one of the key scriptures that I, I really harp on quite a bit is what? Jesus came to bring us an abundant life. That's not what it says. It said he came to give us life and that in abundance. Life in abundance, not abundance in life. There's a big difference. Because what? If we make it abundance in life, what do we chase? Abundance. Because if we don't have abundance, then apparently we're not walking with God. Now, will God bless us? Absolutely. Scriptures make clear he will pour out blessings. But if we're chasing the abundance, then we're not chasing God. The abundance has become God. That's problem. But if we're chasing life, now we have something to truly give to people. Because what? Abundance fades. Abundance wears out. How many of y'all bought stuff recently that's wore out? <laughs> and you got to replace it, right? Mm -hmm. Things wear out. Mm -hmm. Life does not. Life leads to more life. So it's, again, it's, it's such an important thing that we understand Scripture, that we keep it in context, that we keep it the way that it's supposed to be, and we pursue that. But this goes back to our study for the third week. Uh, discipleship. It is a disciplined life. It is a, it's not always easy. It's not always fun. Why? Because you have to start cutting things out. You have to make changes and everything. Like, well, man, you're, you're giving me all these rules. No, I'm not trying to give you rules and regulations, but in rules and regulations, there's safety, one. There's protection, which goes along with safety, right? So not only does it keep you safe, it also prevents boundaries from things coming at you. Not just you get out of bounds, but it keeps things from coming to you. And it's also what happens the more you walk in Discipline, it seems like the greater that road gets, the wider that road gets. Why? More opportunities become available to you because you know how to walk this path. The path is a whole lot broader. I know that from work experience. So when I started working a job one time, my lane was here. But because I did what I was supposed to do and I did it well, it seemed like my lane grew. I had a lot more things thrown at me, a lot more things given to me that wasn't part of the norm for an employee. I got a lot of benefits that other employees didn't get. I got a lot of perks. I got a lot of different things just here that the other employees didn't get. All because I stayed here. That's why Jesus said, what? Narrow is the way. And few be there to find it. We had probably 50 employees. There was probably four of us that got those benefits. That got those perks. That got those extras, if you will. That made working there a little bit easier. <laughs> And that's kind of the idea, even in church, even in Christendom, that's a narrow way. And when you find it, it seems like it gets a whole lot broader on the other side. Because now we start walking in the abundance that God says. We start walking in the freedom that God gives us. We start walking in the joy, the peace. All the things that are promised to us, we truly walk in it. It's not hit and miss. If Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever, shouldn't we also be the same today and forever? Because yesterday's gone. You can't do nothing about yesterday. But today and going into tomorrow, you can prepare for tomorrow. There ain't a whole lot you can do about it. Why? Because we're not there yet. You can prepare, you can make way, but you can't stay so focused on tomorrow that you miss right now. And that's kind of a big thing that's actually starting to really come about, I've noticed, in culture is live in the moment. We should live in the moment. Why? Because that's what we got. We have this moment. We have this time. We have this opportunity to show the love of Jesus. We have this opportunity to share the light of Christ. We have this opportunity to pray over somebody, minister to somebody, bring deliverance, bring healing, bring what they need. Because we're supposed to be providers, not just receivers. The church has gotten so backwards. It's like receivers, and you're supposed to be providing. God works through you, not just to you. And that's an important concept that, again, I think the church has unfortunately forgotten. Because what? We've gotten into a gospel that's about me, 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 me. Even the salvation message has become about me, 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 me. The whole idea, salvation is just the beginning. Now let's go out there and do, 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 do. Yes, Jesus came for you. Yes, he died for you. But now that you're alive, you need to go live for him and live for others, just as he did. Right? Okay, so let's pick up in Ephesians chapter 4. This is where, we're, where we left off last week. Ephesians chapter 4. 
Uh, starting in verse 17. Uh, it will be the New King James Version that I'm using. Uh, if you have any other, just kind of follow along. Is it Ephesians chapter 4, 17? Starting in verse 17. I'm not hurrying today. I really want to kind of go over some things. So this isn't so much a hype message today, if you will. I'm not big into hype messages anyway, not that I don't get excited. But I just I really want to get you guys in this because if you start walking in this on a regular basis, it will transform your life. It will change your life. You will get set free from things you probably didn't even know you were hanging on to and holding you when you start walking this. So everyone there, Ephesians 4, 17? Okay. So who wrote the book of Ephesians? Who was that? Anyone answer? Because class is in session. Who wrote Ephesians? Paul. Paul wrote the letter to the church at Ephesus. Now, Ephesus at this time was the most spiritually mature church. Now, obviously in Revelation, if you get to Revelation, you see where Ephesus got corrected a little bit because they forgot something, their first love. But at this point, this was the most mature church. So Paul is addressing them as a mature church. Still had some issues, still had some things. Why? Because we always should be tweaking. We should always be getting better, always trying to grow more to look like Christ. But what he's sharing with them, that this is how you do life. This is how you do ministry. This is how you live this thing out. It isn't just a philosophy. It isn't just something, you know, we go listen to the scribes and the other people teach and hear. This is how you do. And again, it isn't so much that you keep coming to church, you keep coming to me. No, you get in the Bible, you go to Jesus. I'm here to kind of help point the way, let you know what you already have, tell you to go use what you already have, and let God move in your life. Because this ministry ain't about me. This ministry is about you. This ministry is about our community. That's what we're about. This isn't about elevating the name except for Jesus. If it becomes about anything else other than him, we've got major problems. Uh, it, it just... <laughs> I, I, okay, it's one of my pet peeves. I cannot stand when a church makes it so much about themselves and who they are, their name, 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 name. And look at what we're doing. Look at what, okay. Is that glorifying God or is that just look what you're doing? Because you can be very busy and get nothing done. Look at our own lives, right? How many times have we been busy but never accomplished anything? There's a lot of churches that are extremely busy but aren't accomplishing anything. Why? There's no discipleship. There's no true growth. People are coming week in and week out. They're getting a little dose of feel good, but then they go back out and live like hell and have to go through hell all week long. Mm -hmm. They're not victorious over it. They're not, they're not the overcomer that the Bible says they are. They're struggling all week long. Then they come to church. Oh, I feel good. And then they go right back to the fight. They don't even know how to fight. Right. So what is the church doing? <clears throat> We're supposed to be equipping saints for the work of the ministry. Most of them are so beat up by the time they get to church on Sunday, they don't even know what to do with themselves because they don't know how to walk this thing out. They got a feel good message that tickles the ears, but they don't know how to walk. They don't know how to talk. They don't know how to live it. And again, because we want to draw people in, what do we compromise on just to draw people in? We compromise truth. We compromise the scriptures. Why? Because I don't want to offend anybody. I don't want to hurt their little feelings. Well, you come here, I'll bring you a pacifier and give you a diaper and your blankie. And make, you know, I'll help comfort you along the way, but I'm not worried about your feelings. Because your feelings will lead you straight into hell. And I don't want you going there. I want you to live a life that's victorious. I want you to live a life that's blessed. I want you to live a life that you're walking with the Father. You know the Father. And that the fruit of that is bearing out in you. Because what does that do? That brings Him glory. And then you get to testify, man, look what God did in my life. Not look at what my church is doing. Because God doesn't give a riff about what the church is doing. He cares about what you are doing. It is a personal relationship. Because when you stand before him, he goes, well, our church did. Hmm. He said, that's great, but what did you do? Right. Well, our church was involved in this. That is what I asked you. What did you do? This is an individual, personal walk with Christ. Yes, we partner with churches. Yes, we get a benefit from partnering with what they're doing. Yes. But it's not you actively doing it. You are the disciple. You are the one that puts your hand to the plow and doesn't look back and keeps moving forward to Christ. It's you. So if you want to make it about you, okay. It's about you. You doing the job that God called you to do. You being the person that he died for you to be. You becoming everything that he purposed and planned for you from the time you were even thought of by him, not by your parents, because your parents probably didn't even think about it at the time. Like, oh, now we got a kid. Great. Okay. Let's keep moving on. What's next? Right? 
And sometimes the people that have kids, and then there's not even the consideration to have kids, and the kids get whatever. I know my, my mom was like that. But she, she wanted to live the party life, not the mom life. She was very young, very immature, and it showed. But we have a lot of churches that are exactly the same way. We get them saved, but then we want to keep partying, as it were, and we never grow them up. We never grow our kids up because we haven't grown up. That's a problem. But today we have an opportunity as an individual, as an individual body, to fix the problem. Yes, I talk about the problem so I can highlight them, not so I can just complain about them. I want to highlight them so we can fix them. So we can be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And what I'm sharing with you is the ability to become part of the solution and not continue that cycle that has gone on for way too long. Because again, like I said, and it's, it's, it's hitting me more and more as the times are getting further and further along and I'm seeing prophecies being fulfilled. We've got to become the church that walks in power again. We've got to become that Amen. church that says, Amen. when we go and pray, mountains move. Amen. When we go before Amen. the Lord, communities are changed. When we go before the Lord, things get restored that are supposed to be restored. When we go to the Lord, the world begins to change around us. And we say, hey, the church is going to pray. The people that are doing things they ain't supposed to be doing, they start getting fearful. Because they know when we start praying, all that stuff's going to be brought to light, and they're not going to know what to do about it. They're going to be held to account. Because, again, there was a time that whenever they said the church is going to get together, all the people that are doing things wrong, they, they went into panic mode. Because they knew what was that they were doing was about to come to a very swift end. And it still needs to be that way today. Is it the same God? Yeah. Is it the same Holy Ghost? Amen. Is it the same power? Now, what's changed? It wasn't God. It's the church. It's time we get back to what God told us to do. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's get back into this. Okay, it says, This I say, verse 17, Therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should, who? Remember, I said this about who? <laughs> you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles. Well, who were the Gentiles? Non covenant people. Right? right? That was us before Christ. So he's telling me, Look, if you're in Christ, don't walk like that anymore. Don't live your life that way. That has to stop. Okay? He says what? In the futility of their mind. Now, some translations may use a different term there. Uh, what do you have? Is it futility in yours as well? Mine is futility. Mine yeah. says um, that they are hopelessly confused. <laughs> hopelessly confused. That's how they're walking. In hopelessness and confusion. that look familiar today? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Anybody got the Amplified? Want to pull that up real quick? Take a look at this. It's interesting what it actually says here, the different variations on this. It, it, is, it, it is absolutely amazing to me when we start looking. Paul wrote this to the church of Ephesus, and it's like he was writing it today. That is how you know when it is truth. It doesn't matter the span of time. It stays constant. I've read messages from pastors from way back. Other than some words we don't use, the message that they were preaching can be preached today. It might not be accepted today, but it could be preached today because it was just it was a solid truth. <coughs> it's the word of God, and the word of God does not change. Now, verse 18. So why were they walking the way that they were walking? Having their understanding darkened, being alienated, separated, not part of, from the life of God. Why? Because what? They have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with what? Greediness, selfishness, selfish gain. He says, but you have not so learned Christ. That's what he said. You don't see that in Jesus. So what's really going on here? Yeah. All right? If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth. Now it's interesting. He said that you've been taught by Jesus. Jesus was dead and gone. But what do we have? The Holy Spirit. Right. Jesus said, I will send you another that is equal to me. Right. The same as, same substance, same value, equal. I will send you another. His job will be to lead you into all truth. Right. So he's saying, here, look, Jesus has taught you. This is how you're supposed to be walking. So he's, he's just putting it out there. He doesn't pull punches. He's just... This is how it is. Now, he's saying this in love. He's a father, right? He's viewing these churches and everyone in that church from a father's perspective. He cares about them deeply. He loves them deeply. He wants to see them succeed in everything that they do. 
If you're a father, you know that. You want to see your kids succeed. If you're a mother, you want to see your kids succeed. You want them to have the best of everything they could possibly have. How much more so for those of us that are spiritual and connected with the Father, want for our kids, want for mm. our ministry, yes. those that are under us. We yes. want the Absolutely. best for them, yes. right? Yes. And that's, that should be our goal. It should be what's best for them. Now, as parents, what do we do? We tend to sacrifice, don't we? Mm -hmm. We make accommodation. We do what it takes to make sure that they succeed, even at our own cost. The Father set that example by sending his son, even at his own cost, mm -hmm. that we could have the very best. We should follow his example. I think things would get a whole lot better for everybody. All right, let's keep going. Said so you, you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That what? You put off concerning your former conduct, your way of living, your lifestyle. Everybody says, well, I was born this way. Well, get born again. Put that stuff off. Cut it out. The old man, which what? Grows corrupt. According to the deceitful lust. What does that mean? It gets worse. As things grow, what? It amplifies. You put the tree, plant a tree, it starts off small. There's this little stem sticking out of the ground. You give it some time, you get a tree. And it's got roots. It's got limbs. And now what is it doing? At some point, it's going to start wanting to reproduce itself. Look at our society. We get one little root of sin, and now it's been fertilized. Why? Oh, it's okay. We'll, we'll tolerate that. We'll accommodate that. We'll justify that. We'll make it. You can do however you want to do as long as you're happy. We're not, we don't want to offend you, so we won't offend you. You can do whatever you want. We'll accept that. And look how bad it's starting to get. Go back and look at history. Every culture, every society that has embraced what America and the world now is embracing has failed and has fallen. And when it fell, it was bad. Yes, you want to live a life of sin? Go ahead, live a life of sin. We don't want you to, but feel free to do so because you have the freedom of choice. Right. Just don't expect us to have to go along with you. Right. You want to go off the cliff and you're, you're bent on doing it and we're trying to stop you, but you're bent on doing it? It's not that I don't love you. Well, we can only do so much if you're bent on doing that because what? You'll find a way to get it done. Right. Last thing we want, definitely not our desire. Our heart is for you to live and to, to thrive. But some people, it doesn't matter what you do. You can try to pull them off the cliff. They're going, they're going to go. Don't take it personal when they do. Sometimes we get caught in that. Because of our emotional concern for people, we try to help them, try to help them, try to help them. You can't change them. Hear me. You cannot change them. You can try to help. You can try to minister. But at the end of the day, when they make their choice, they make the choice. You didn't make the choice. Why are you taking it as a personal failure if they failed? They made the choice. You didn't make the choice. They did. You loved them through that. The Father loves everybody. That, that The verse out of Romans 8, which says, you know, nothing can separate us from the love of God. That is absolutely true. It's also absolutely true. There are people in hell today that God absolutely loves, and he has never stopped loving them. But guess what? They chose to be eternally separated from him. It was a choice. It doesn't stop his love. And guess what? He's also not offended by it. He loves them. But they made a choice. And you know what? He honored their choice. Is that hard at times? <laughs> yeah, it's hard. But you don't live there. You don't stay there. You let them make their choice. Parents, a lot of times, will base their identity off what their kids do. When their kids make mistakes, how somehow it's the parents' fault. Um, No, the kids have the ability to choose. They have the ability to think. So guess what? Sometimes they don't think so well. <laughs> Sometimes they're dumb. They do stupid things. Sometimes that stupid thing costs them. It hurts them. It's not you. You love them. But if you make it about you, you will never see clear to help them and to minister to them and to bring them out of that situation. What makes our Father so good is the fact that he's able to love truly, love purely, and he's able to see clear in the situation, no matter how cloudy it is for us, he can see clear to pull us out. But again, if we don't get the sin under control in our life, it will lead us down all these roads. We don't walk contrary to our former conduct. All right, let's keep going. I've only a few verses into this thing. It goes on. He said, and be what? Renewed in the spirit of your mind. mind. So in the church of Rome, he tells them, you need to renew your mind. 
Now here he says to renew you in the spirit of your mind. Yesterday was a big game. There was a lot of spirit going on, right? Team spirit. Gators have their spirit. Some don't have their spirit, right? It's a team spirit. It's a team mentality. It's something they get excited about, something they get pumped up about, something they, man, they focus on drive into. And then there's that Paul uses the term in the spirit of your mind. What do you focus on? What do you celebrate? What do you go after? What do you highlight in your life? What is a big deal to you? Because what you focus on, you will drive into. Good, bad, otherwise, whatever you focus on will become your reality. That's not just a world thought. That isn't just, oh, the secret or whatever, you know, the manifestation and the vibration and all the other stuff. There is science behind that, guys, so it isn't all bad. What's bad is they operate the stuff illegally. They operate it out... They operate in the spiritual realm without going through God. Okay, there is, there is science behind all of this stuff, and it is legit. But again, they operate it in a, a, a spiritually illegal way. So, so keep this in mind. So you put off the former conduct. You put off that old you, that old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And then interesting, that lust is deceitful. It sounds good. It looks good. Mm -hmm. At the end, it ain't so good. Right? That temptation will get you there, but it'll leave you wanting. You go to the Proverbs, it talks about that. Or I think it's Proverbs. I think Revelation. One of the two. It talks about where the man goes into the woman. She's been whispering and drawing him in, drawing him in, drawing him in. And finally goes in. He goes, but then her, de her bed is death. The end is death. It looks good. It's enticing. But the end is death. We have to be very careful what we allow to entice us. We have to be on guard continually. Because what did the devil entice Jesus with? Fame, position, all of those things. But the first thing he made him question was, are you really the son of God if you're the son of God? The devil does the same thing. Well, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, and typically what he'll fill in the blank with is what some churches said. Well, you don't do this. You don't live like that. You don't live what you know, Pastor so -and -so, such and such said. Here's the deal. It doesn't matter what such and such said. What matters is what God said. Because prior to Jesus going to be tempted, he said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So you go on the last of what the father said. This is my son. Now to those that believe, he's become, has given the power to become the sons of God. If you're in this room and you believe this morning, guess what your position is? You're a son. Don't ever question that. And don't let the devil question you. Because as soon as that question comes in, are you really a son? You need to shut it down right there. And very simply, start praising the Father that you're a son. Don't get into the argument with the devil, because you get arguing with the devil. He, he will twist it. He's been at this a long time, and he's good at arguing. So why get in the conversation? Eve's mistake, she got into a conversation with the wrong person. Yeah. Think about it. That's where Eve failed. She got into a conversation and said, you know what? No, God said, and walked away. We, we want to hang out in the conversation sometimes. That's what gets us in trouble. Just walk away. You don't have to stay involved in the conversation. Well, that's rude. I don't care. It might cost me my life. I don't need to be involved in the conversation that's going to kill me. Don't care how good it looks. Walk away. In the spirit of your mind, what are you focused on? What drives you? What excites you? Make sure that it's gone. Make sure it's the things of the spirit. Make sure it's those things that get you going. Because if not, then the enemy will find a foothold in you and, and he will twist and manipulate and try to do everything he can to tear you down. Okay? Let's keep going. All right. <clears throat> this, is the, this is what makes verse-by-verse -verse teaching so fun. Because it's all good. It's all truth. And that's how you build. Paul said, I teach a line upon line, precept upon precept. What? That's how you build a house. Line upon line, precept upon precept. But you have to start with a solid foundation. And that's Jesus. Amen? Amen. Okay, y'all quiet this morning. Don't get so quiet. This is a good message. It's good stuff. It's good truth. Where was I? Renew it. Okay, to verse 24. And that you put on what? New nature. New nature, new man, which was created what? Hmm. And true righteousness and holiness. Wow. So that's the nature that we should see. That's the nature that other people should see. So let me ask the question. <laughs> what nature are people seeing? What nature are those around you seeing come out of your life? What nature are they seeing come from your conversation, as it were? Okay, the way you live, what do people see? 
More importantly, what does God see? Because you can put on a good show in front of people. And the Father sees all. Even what goes on up here. He knows it. Okay? So what conversation are you having? Is it true righteousness? Is it godliness? Is it that nature? How do you put on the nature of God? You take the word of God and you make it you. We call it DNA. Brother Kirby calls it divine nature attributes. He's right. The Bible cover to cover is the attributes and nature of God. It, everything that is God. And Jesus was the expressed image of God. The word become flesh. And the flesh dwelt among us. What? He said, follow me. What? That means we can do what he did. We can be like him. We're actually commanded to be like him. So it's not optional. We're to put on that new man. So here's Paul telling Put on that new nature. Live this way. What? So, and here's the importance of it. Let's keep going. 25. Therefore, put it away. What? Lying? Is there any brings up lying? A false presentation is lying, guys. False representation is lying. Right? Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For what? We are members of one another. What you, would do, what you do affects others. Whether you do it in secret or not, what you do affects others. It does not matter. You can try to hide it all day long. It's going to come out, and it will infect others. And I, I do mean that, infect others. Because what? We're one body. Doesn't the scripture say when, we, when one hurts, we all hurt? Yeah. It doesn't matter whether they're across the world. But here's the deal. What happens when one of us has become stronger? all become stronger. Now what happens if we all start becoming stronger? Who else is that going to affect? Who is that going to impact? Whose life is that going to impact around you? As you become stronger, who is that going to build up around you? Glenn, you're already experiencing this. How many friends recently that have you ministered to and been ministered to and that you're starting to see the fruit? Mm -hmm. Take some time. <laughs> it, it takes some water and it takes a boy, you were really stupid in that. That's okay. Come on, let's keep working through that, right? But now you're seeing the fruit of it. Because what? You've stayed the course. Right. Let them be stupid, but you stay constant. As you stay constant, you stay strong, people will see that. And what? They begin to get drawn to that. Which is amazing. What? Moths are draw, drawn to what? A light. A light. Hmm. Okay, sometimes you've got moths hanging around you. They're being drawn to the light. Sooner or later, God can transform them. Yeah. Make them into something beautiful. I've seen some really pretty moths. I don't know if y'all have. I've seen them. Beautiful. Big. Very awesome. Anyway. Sometimes we, we mistake the nuisance. We don't give it the opportunity to see the beauty. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's true. So let's face it. Sometimes the things flying around us are more of a nuisance, at least in our mind. But if you'll stop and step back and look at it as the Father would see it, hey, that's beauty. That's creation. That's something I did. Mm -hmm. And see God working through them. See how God would see them. They may not see it themselves, but if you don't see that, how are they ever going to get there? Because you know what? You may be the only Jesus that people see. Are you going to help them become who they were intended to be? Or are you going to allow them to stay where they're at just because you've already judged them? And now you're holding judgment against them. And guess what? When you hold judgment, the Father holds judgment. And they stay in that same position and place. Be careful what you say about people driving down the road. That's right there is where a lot of the truth comes out. When you're driving, mm, people cut you off. They don't turn fast enough. They forget what the blinkers are for. <laughs> Or they have to blink her on for miles. Oh my gosh. Like, pick the one. Mm. That's the one. Let's turn it off. But this is the fast lane, not the slow lane. Move over. Find the long skinny pedal on the right. Hit that bad boy. It's not scared. Go ahead and do it. You can. It's it's, it is possible. It's not scared. Right? It's. Or my car. Anyway. Um, but you see what I'm saying? There's little things in our life. We all have our own things that kind of set us off. What are those things? What are the things that get under your skin? Because if it can still get under your skin, you need to get new skin. Because if you don't have that new skin, again, the devil can play with you. And he will. That's right. Get new skin. All right. Now, what does it say? Let's keep going. Because remember, someone body, verse 26. Be angry. Don't stop there. Some people want to stop there. And do not sin. It's okay to get angry. It's what you do with it that can become the problem. Anger can motivate you to get a job done. Anger can have you go out there. When you see a situation that is so wrong, so adverse, and you said, you know what? I'm going to do something about that. 
There have been men in our history that said, you know what? This cannot stand. And I'm not going to stand for it. And they stepped up. They stepped into the gap. And they did things that no one else would do. They suffered persecution initially. But then they changed the world. How many members of people of history can you think of right now that have done that very thing? They stepped up. They went against the flow. Initially, it caused problems. And sometimes it even cost them their lives. <laughs> but because of their actions, we have liberty today. We have freedoms today. We have access to things we didn't have access to so long ago. Because somebody said, you know what? Enough's enough. This stuff stops. And on my watch, I'm ending this thing. What do you need to end in your life? What maybe do you need to end in your history's lineage that has been going on and the devil likes to keep bringing Amen. that crap back? Amen. I'm not calling it a generational curse. It's not that. It's generational stupidity. Because That's monkey right. see, monkey do. Right? People don't know how to make a decision. You know what? I'm not going to follow that same path. If I followed Amen. the path of most of my family, I'd be in jail right now. Yeah, true, right. With and More than you know the kids that I have. Because my family's lineage says, hey, do this, 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 and this. This is how we operate. Well, I don't like your mode of operation. It sucks. It doesn't bring life. It brings destruction. It brings drama. It brings hurt yeah. feelings. It brings separation. It brings all the things that are contrary to one to the scripture that most of them say that they believe in. I'm like, well, you say you believe in it. You sure don't live it. But if I followed their path, I'd be in a really bad way. I said, you know what? I don't like that. <laughs> but what happens for me? Oh, you just think you're better than us. No. That's nothing to do with me being better than you. I don't want to follow your path. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad you want me to go with you. I just don't want to participate in your nonsense. Mm -hmm. Because do you really like your life? Because all I ever hear is complaining. All I hear is drama. All I hear is hurt. And you so and so said this, and we did that. And blah. It's like I, I'm good. <laughs> Wait, there's more. No, I don't want to turn off. Change channel. <laughs> You're not that good of a salesman. I'm moving on. Right. I'll wait next hour for QVC to come back on. Maybe that guy's gone. I have to deal with the orange blue guy. Um, it just, you have the ability, guys, to change the channel in your life. Mm. You have the ability to change what you're listening to. You have the ability to walk away from those things that are trying to draw you in. Yeah. Choose the better path. Yeah. It's okay to be angry. Just don't sit in it. Don't stay there. Don't sin, right? And don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Nor give what? Place to the devil. It's interesting. It says, don't be angry. Don't sin. And it keeps on going. It says, don't give place to the devil. Because yeah. the longer you stay angry, it will turn into something that's selfish. Yeah. It will turn into something that's ungodly. And the devil said, aha, yep. now yeah. I can plant a seed. I've got the ground ready. I've got the fertilizer in there. Now I can plant that seed. And then what happens? That seed is bitterness. Yep. That seed is resentment. Mm -hmm. That seed is unforgiveness. Yep. Hmm. And we already said what happens. It grows up. It turns into something far greater than what you ever thought it would. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you let that, suit, that seed take root. Mm -hmm. All right, let me keep going. Verse 20. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who's in need. What? Live contrary to what you used to be. You were a thief? Stop it. Go get a job. Work. But work so that you can give. Because right. you've taken. Now it's time to give back. We've taken. Let's start giving back, guys. God has given us so much. How dare we hang on to what he's given us? Why? Because he's already given it to you once. He can give it to you again. Amen. If, he, if he put money in your wallet last week, he's going to put it in his wallet next week. Amen. It's the same God that provides. You keep looking to man to provide, then man becomes God. Mm -hmm. And that's in every area. That isn't just financial. Don't let man become God in your life. That, that, is a, that will take you down a path you don't want to go. Now, <clears throat> verse 29. Let no corrupt word. Mm -mm. No corrupt word. Zero. Zero. Do what? Come out of your mouth. Mm. Okay. No front word come out of your mouth. Mm. So where does that leave complaining? Where does that leave lying? Where does that leave manipulation? Where does that leave, you know, hey, I'm going to say words just to get somebody on my side. Mm -hmm. To get them to feel for me, but I'm not actually going to tell the truth. I just, you know, it was this definition of narcissists, right? I want to make me the victim make them the problem when right. the reality is it's the other way around you are the problem right. they're the victim but because you know you're only reacting because of the way they react it's just a, it's a ridiculous cycle right. 
And so, so you know what? I made a mistake. I'm going to own my mistake. I'm going to walk that out and deal with that before the Lord. I'm not going to blame them because I chose to respond poorly. That's what people do. They want to blame other people for their response. It doesn't matter what they did. Well, you don't understand how bad it hurt. I don't care how bad it hurt you. Did you go to a cross? Did you have the flesh peeled off your back? Did you have nails put in your hand? Did you have your beard pulled out? Did you go through what Jesus went through? No. Just shut up. I don't care. You're not Jesus. And if you think you're better than him because somebody said something about you that you didn't like, oh, he was perfectly innocent. They put him on a cross. Right. They killed him. And you're complaining because somebody didn't like the way you looked. Oh. Here's your diaper and here's your pacifier. Here's your blanket. I'll give you a little place in the corner to go be comforted. Get over it. That is so selfish to have that mentality. I'm going to retaliate because of what they did to me. I'm going to retaliate because of what they said about me. I'm going to, I, me, 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 me. It's interesting that the devil said I several times and it fallen like lightning from heaven. Because mm. he wanted to exalt himself above the throne of God. But if you make it all about you that way, now you're elevating yourself as God. And I promise you, God will humble you. It's better to be humble before God than to be humbled before God. You can either do it by choice or you can do it by force. It's a whole lot better for you when you do it by choice. Because someday, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then what are you going to do? And Brother Curry talked about it this way. He said, you know, he said, I believe there's going to be an angel. For those that didn't want to bow, he's going to stand behind and put their foot on their neck and just push them down. Now you're going to bow. You had the opportunity to do it before. Now you don't have a choice. You will either worship him willingly or you're going to bow before him and face judgment. I'd rather worship willingly and have the Father say, well done, son. Yeah. Welcome into the rest that I've prepared for you. He's done so much work for us. And we complain about little trivial things that we have to go through here. We worry about the he said, she said, and you know the rest of the song. That's what we get caught up in, isn't it? Think about it. How much of that has been our life? How much of that has been our social dynamic? Such as that said, or so and so did. Or, you know, now we all the TikTok stars or the, the whoever, we're following those guys because they said it, now we want to do it. Okay, Tide Pods was a result of TikTok. Oh, oh, oh let's do the Tide Pod Challenge. Go ahead. That'll, right there, that'll occur the, 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 the people real quick. You want to be stupid, you're going to die. Eat them Tide Pods. Right down the hallway, bud. So, again, think of how many stupid things that people follow because it was a fad. It was a trick straight down. You walk right into it. The, okay, again, this is what happens when we follow stupidity. It leads to more stupidity. Right? I think Todd Potts was a perfect example of that. Okay, how about the ice challenge, the salt and ice challenge? Oh, gosh. That's self harm. Or the eraser challenge. Or the eraser challenge. Oh, look, Indian right, right, right. Oh, yeah. Oh, crap. Now it's a scar. Well, you dumb. That's a good reminder. Don't do it again. Think, okay, think about stupid things you've done because somebody said something. You know, oh, they don't try that. Oh, that's a good idea. But afterwards, you're like, oh, that wasn't a good idea. Because why? Now you're dealing with the, 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 the choice that you made. You're dealing with the seed that was sown. But do but you see what I'm saying? We can laugh about it because we've all done stupid things because somebody said. Stupid is, stupid does. Right? But seriously, but it all starts with what comes out of our mouth. Oh, things done cracked up now, we're in trouble. I want to get you going. Give him a minute. <laughs> so, we already said watch what comes out your mouth. But what needs to come out of our mouth is what? Let's keep going. What is necessary for edification. edification, encouragement? What is that? That's building up of somebody. Remember what I said about positive gossip? Yes. If you're going to yes. gossip about somebody, build them up, yes. even when they're not around. Okay? People go through struggles. Let's continue to build them up even when they're not around. Why? Because we're speaking life into maybe a, a, a death situation. Speak life. We don't know everybody's situation. We don't know. Again, they could have done made a stupid decision. We made stupid decisions. Let's let the Lord bring them out. Again, if they choose to stay in that, okay, let them go off the cliff. I don't want them to. 
But again, we can't hang on to the point where it's causing us harm and causing other harm because we won't let them, you know, go in their foolishness. Even God lets them go in their foolishness. Why? Because he gave them over to a debased mind. Look at Romans 1. Why? Because they pursued it. They would, they would, they wanted it that bad. God says, okay. You want it that bad? I will give it to you. Not what I want. But what does it do? He still speaks life. He still offers life. He still offers blessing. Even though they're walking in their foolishness, he still gives it there. So what? Let us, what comes out of our mouth, be for edification. Let it be for building. What? That it may impart grace to the hearers. How many of you understand that grace is empowering? Grace gives you the ability to do what you could not do within yourself. It gives you the ability to do for you and others what you couldn't do within your own strength. That's what grace will do. Grace is not cheap. There's a gospel now that says, well, grace, grace, grace covers everything because well, I can go out there whatever I want, but grace is going to cover it. No, Paul made that clear. It doesn't work that way. Right. You don't keep sinning because grace is going to cover you now. No. No. Grace empowers you with the ability to not sin. Right. You're not damned to be a sinner all your life. You have the ability to sin, but that's not your identity. You want to make it your identity, that's on you, not on God. God says, if you sin, you have an advocate, not when you sin. So we speak life and we that it might be grace to those here. Again, this comes back to what I was saying about the church and its ability to disciple people to get them to grow up in the Lord. We should be speaking things that's going to give them the grace to be able to make it through the week, not skip by and hopefully they make it in. Because what? The devil's been chasing them. No, I have grace which empowers me to walk as a victor, not a victim. I'm going to walk in dominion. I'm not going to walk in defeat. I'm going to walk as a son, not as a servant. How are you going to walk? The choice is yours. I'm going to walk as a son. I'm not going to keep walking as a servant. Why? Because now I'm a son. Before Jesus, before cross, before all that, yes, I was a servant. Now? <laughs> now I'm a son. That's a big difference. That's a big position change. Now, I don't say that so I can be arrogant and I'll go out there and lord that over people. Jesus said, look, you don't lord it over one another. <laughs> Absolutely not. Jesus said, I came to what? Serve, not be served. And he's the son of God. Uh-oh. There's a lot of pastors that want to be served today. Mm. Mm. You ain't Jesus, buddy. Yeah. And Jesus washed feet. What are you doing? Mm. Oh, they come, they serve me, they give me, they do this, and I ride around that. And I, oh, those are a lot of things. What about the people? When's the last time you got your hands dirty? When's the last time you cleaned the toilet? When's the last time you got out there and got around people that didn't smell good, look good, whatever, and you were there loving on them? Or are you too good for that now because you are pastor or your apostle or your evangelist or your prophet now you're too good to get your hands dirty because you have a title <laughs> you better go back and look at scripture <laughs> that fivefold that fourfold ministry is actually lower than everybody else mm -hmm. and people well i have a title i'm better than nope. you you just acknowledge the fact that you're supposed to serve more but you err not knowing the scriptures as jesus once said <laughs> Let's lift up. Let's build up. Let's make sure we're walking in truth. What? That others can also have that grace too. Verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't make what he has done for you a mockery. Don't make what he's done for you a joke. There's many people out there that have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. The power thereof. Walking in God, you walk in power. The Holy Spirit's in you, you walk in power. The church is not walking in power. They're walking in precepts. They're walking in legalism. They're walking in the knowledge of the Scripture. They don't know the Father, and they're not allowing the Holy Spirit to operate in them and through them in power. Why? Oh, because that stuff stopped. Really? Show me in Scripture where it stopped. You show me where prophecy stopped. You show me where healing stopped. You show me where the gift of tongues stopped. You show me in Scripture where that stuff stopped. Good luck. You're not going to find it. Because I am that person. You want to tell me something, stop and show me. My God is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Amen. is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. What he started in scripture, it's still going on. Until when? Until we don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. When will we not need it anymore? Mm -hmm. When we're either with him or new heaven, new earth is in place. At that point, we have no more need for healings. We have no more need for all those things like that. We don't have need of the gifts of the spirit. Why? Because we're in the spirit completely. Now we need the gifts. Now we need the operation of the Spirit. Now we need the Holy Spirit working through us that we can get the job done. 
And if we start doing that a lot more often, we get this job wrapped up a whole lot faster. You can come back a whole lot sooner. But we have people who want to argue with us about it. Why? Because some people got stupid and went off the chain on things that wasn't Bible. They were speaking in tongues. Great, but which tongues was it? Was it the tongue of God or was it a fleshly manifestation of the tongues? That's where the problems come in. There's a fleshly manifestation of all the different operations of the gifts. What? There's a carnal expression of those things. And what? Because of that, people want to swing all the way to the other side of the spectrum and say, well, that's not of God. No, what they're doing is not of God. You're not going to tell me the operation of the gifts of the Spirit is not of God. What they're doing is not of God. But you want to lump God in there and throw the baby out with the bathwater, as it were. No. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You grieve the Holy Spirit by not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Not letting him out of you whenever you go somewhere. He's the pastor in the car of your flesh. And when you go somewhere, he just wants out whenever you get out. He wants you to love people. He wants you to put hands on people. He wants you to minister and show the love of God. Show the light of God to the world. <laughs> but it's very difficult to do that if you don't do the next part. Verse 31. Let all, not some, not a little bit, all. What? Bitterness, wrath, wrath anger, anger, clamor, right. evil speaking, be put away from you. Remember the children of Israel, the ones that the, uh, the ten spies that came back and gave a evil report. report? Why was it evil? Because it was contrary to what the word of God said, what the promise of the Lord was. They spoke against what God said. Oh, we can't take the land. God said it's already yours. Mm -hmm. Go in and possess it. They said, well, we can't do that. You know, we're grasshoppers in our eyes, and we must have been in theirs. So they made an assumption because their imagination was problematic, and they built something up, a stronghold in them that was contrary to the word of God. That's what they began to speak. What imagination has become a stronghold in your mind and in your life that you begin to speak that's contrary to the word of God? We call them sacred cows. We call them things that are contrary to Scripture, but we have made it a very religious context, and it's spoken in churches all over the place. Why? Because it sounds good, or you know, because somebody has said it so long, it must be true. You know, and in reality, is most times it's not. It's not true. Healing is for everyone. No exceptions. Do we always see it? Unfortunately, no. Does not change the truth of Scripture. The healing was paid for in the atonement. Part of that atonement process was first the whipping post. By his wounds, you were healed. That's not spiritual. Spiritual aspect was taken care of at the cross. Because what? That's where sin was dealt with. Right. Healing was dealt with at the whipping post. They are separate. That's why even in the when we take communion, it's separated. Right. They said there are many sick and even died among you because they do not discern the body and the blood. How was sin dealt with? Blood. Go through the old covenant. Look at all the sacrifices. Sin was dealt with by blood. Right. Healing had to be dealt with through the body of Christ through the stripes. And it's still true today. You go look at the original Greek text and how it's written out, how it's processed. There is no question about healing at all. It becomes a question when people don't see it happen and they get mad at God because it didn't happen. And they have to come up with some excuse and justification as to why. Two things. And this is where people don't like to hear it. Unbelief or a tradition of man. Those are the two reasons we don't see things operate in our lives. Well, I was believing. No, you might have been agreeing. Mm -hmm. Because when you have faith, faith gets the job done. Why? Jesus said, if you have faith as a mustard seed. So what? If you have faith, period. If you have any type of faith, you can say to the mountain, be moved, cast to the sea, and what? It will get up and move itself to the sea. But what we have is faith degrees or faith breakers, right? This is the cap, right? If you're in sales, some people have a sales cap. They feel like they can only reach this level and that's where they'll stop. And they'll only strive for that level. It's that breakthrough, that plateau. When you're working out, you reach a plateau. You have to press through to get to that next level. Faith is no different. You have to press through. Because some of you, I believe that, you know, God will heal my headache and take care of my headache. And they stop right there. Or here's the funny thing. They'll believe that God can heal somebody else through them but not touch them. Okay? Or, they have such a familiarity and uh, experience where victory happens in one area of healing, so that's what they pursue is that one area. Man, they are super effective in that area of healing. Great! 
But what does that do for someone else that doesn't have that? Now you got to send them to somebody else. Mm -hmm. God is all, but what we tend to focus on is one thing. Right? This is why we have the ministers in the back of the day. Some were good with the gift of prophecy. Some were good with the gift of the word of knowledge. Some were gifted in healing. So, right? Why? Because they focused on that one thing where they had success and they developed that one thing. Jesus never developed one area. He always operated in what? Every area. So what? That whatever somebody may have need of, I can give as they have need. That's maturity. That is walking with the spirit. What? That I can let whatever someone needs come out of me when they need it because what? It comes from my father in heaven. If they need healing, doesn't matter what it is, I can let that flow through me because it's God in me that touches them and heals them. I'm just a conduit and get the job done. No matter what it is. But again, it's growing in that, not by what we see, but by who we know. Right? Let's keep going. With all malice, what does it say? So you put these things with you with all malice. Someone look up the definition real quick of malice. Everybody here and here pretty much has a phone or some type of technology. Look up the definition of malice. put it away. Malice ultimately ends up being hatred. So you put that thing with everything that, that you, anything that repulses you, anything that just it absolutely disgusts you, right? How many of you have things in your life you can think of right now, as I said that, that you're like, mm, 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 nope, not in my life. That's, that's how these things need to be. You put it away with that type of hatred. You put it that way with that type of evil intent, if you will. Because you know what? I am so adverse to that thing, it ain't coming near me. That's the intentionality you have on it. But what's the adverse? Verse 32. And be what? Kind. kind. Tenderhearted. Uh-oh. Forgiving one another. Uh-oh. How dare the church do that? Forgive somebody. And why is he having to write this to the church? Why is he having to write to the church folks about forgiving? Because they weren't. Let that settle in. Look at today. <laughs> Don't just put it there. Look at today. <clears throat> right, this to the church. Y'all need to forgive. And you see something back in the back. Right? Because they're back in the back. They're already going through their list. 20 years ago, they did that. Uh -oh. right, so they're, you know what I'm saying? They're going through the list and they're like, well, that pastor just don't know what I'm going through. Don't care. Do you know what Jesus went through? Forgive. Exactly. You want to make it about you. Are you God? Are you going to hold on forgiveness so they go to hell? That's great. Good job. Let me pat you on the back for being that way. Forgive one another. What? Even as what? Uh-oh. Oh. Man. Paul said, oh, I'm not going to give you an excuse now. You've got to forgive. Why? Because God forgave you. <laughs> That's the goodness of the Father. And we're supposed to represent him. So how are we doing that? How are we representing others? Man, I have a lot more I'm supposed to get to today. Hey, I, I do want to leave you with this. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Because we're still in discipleship. All this is discipleship. All this is growing to look more like Jesus. Every bit of this is how we are supposed to walk out our life in Christ. And it is so important that we do that so others can see it. Now again, others see it, but we also get the benefit from it, guys. When we start truly walking this thing out, things will change in your life. Your finances will change. Your health will change. Your mental state will change. Everything about you will begin to change and transform. Now, you may not see it initially, but again, why? It has to grow. I didn't give you uh, uh, verse 4. Starting in verse 4. But guys, again, so we talked about how the sin, that seed of sin will grow and become something, right? So too will the seed of faith. It will get in you and it will become something. If you'll feed it, if you'll go after it. Because again, the enemy will come quickly to take the seed of the word which is sown in your life. He comes immediately to take that from you. You have to start doing something with it immediately. What you're learning from the Lord, you have to do something with it immediately. Share it. Apply it. Do something so that it gets settled in you. So what do we have to do? Again, we're talking about this stuff where the enemy wants to come in. Uh, uh, helps if I go to the right chapter for you. Chapter 10, verse 4. I want to check. I talked about this initially, the mind, 
what we hear, what we receive, what we talk about, what we listen to, what comes out of our mouth. Because here's the deal, guys. What you're speaking is just as vital as what you're hearing from other people. Because you're speaking it, it's going out of your mouth, back into your ears. Mm -hmm. And I was sharing this with my wife the other day. Your mind is the most fertile soil ever. Because it takes whatever it gets in there and it begins to try to develop it on its own. You don't even have to try. Your mind will try to grow whatever is put into it. So it's important what you feed it and what you continue to feed it because you're reinforcing what you're hearing. You're reinforcing what you're receiving and that thing that you're receiving and that you're reinforcing will grow. So if it's negativity, guess what? It's going to grow. If it's doubt, it's going to grow. If it's something contrary to the word of God, it's going to grow. Right? If you're dealing with something and you keep focusing on a thing and all thing you speak about it is negative or the reality in your mind of what that thing is, that thing is going to continue to grow. You have to begin to declare life, even if it's opposite of what you're feeling, which is fine. Let the weak say I'm strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Mm -hmm. That's what the scriptures declare. You have to start speaking truth, regardless of what your facts may be at the time. Your fact may be I'm going through this. The truth says I'm already on the other side of it. Amen. The facts say I may feel this way. The truth says I am healed, set free, delivered, made whole, preserved. You have to speak truth against what you may be feeling, what you may be seeing, what you may be experiencing. Because your experience does not dictate and change the word of God. Amen. Even though people try to do it all the time. But what are these things? You know what? Let's just go ahead and start at the beginning. Verse 1. I'm only going to cover a couple of verses. 6. It says, now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. It's funny Paul says that, and he's not very meek or gentle. Um, he says, I am <laughs> meek when face to face with you. So apparently when Paul was in the presence of people, he was actually very gentle. He was very easy. Depending on who he was with, he was very easy with people. But in his letters, what does he say? But bold towards you when absent. So I ask that when I am present with you, I need not be bold. With the confidence which I propose to be what? Courageous against some. So he's saying, I will deal with what I gotta deal with. But I'm hoping to come to you in gentleness. I'm hoping to come to you as a father. I don't have to come with you with a rod of correction. I want to come to you in love. I want to be able to come to you and hang out with you and have a good time. I don't want to have to address issues with you. No parent wants to have to go to their kid and address issues. That is like the last thing we ever want to do. But Paul said, it's not that I won't, I just don't want to. Right, who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh, but for though we walk in the flesh, we do not what? War according to the flesh. We do not war, we do not fight, our battles not that way. For the weapons of our warfare are what? Not of the flesh, not carnal, but divinely powerful. I like that. Divinely powerful for the destruction of what? Strongholds. Yep, the tearing down or breaking down strongholds, or and mine says destruction of fortresses. So what was a stronghold? It was a place that you could run into and what? The enemy could assault that thing and assault that thing and do what? You are safe inside that stronghold. And what? You can still fight back from the stronghold because what? It had places where you could actually fire at the enemy. But within that stronghold, the enemy couldn't get to you. Right? Well, I'm going to put this on you a little bit because what it's about to be ready to go into, do you have a stronghold in your life that God can't get to you but you try to fire back at God? Have you built up a stronghold in your mind, in your life, either through religion or your experience or whatever, to where God's trying to get to you, but you've ran into this stronghold? Ooh. And in essence, you're kind of like Adam and Eve. You're hiding from God Ooh. because he's trying to bring out truth in you. He's trying to bring out something in you, but you've ran into your stronghold because that's your safe place. But you're hiding from God. And you're firing back at God and you're giving God your excuses. You're giving God your justifications and your rationalizations because of the things being the way they are. And because you're happy being there, he says, but this is a bad place for you. I want you better. But no, no, I'm in my hiding hole. Stay over there. Wow. And you won't even let God in because you've developed a stronghold of whatever it is. Some religion, some tradition, some nonsense. Guys, for the past couple of years, probably three or four years, I have really been seeking God on strongholds and tearing them down. 
So why am I so adamant about tearing these things down? Because I know what it's done for me by tearing them down. I know what it can do for you. I have no doubt in my mind that once these religious strongholds that are in people's lives get tore down, and I'm, I'm going to try to obliterate them. I'm going to go in like napalm. I'm going to go in like an A-bomb and blow these things up. Because why? It will set you free. You will be able to walk with God, with confidence, with boldness, without hesitation. And it may offend people. And typically it's going to be the religious folks. But get out of that stronghold. Let God in. If you want to keep something out, keep the devil out. Because he's the one that needs to battle your life anyway. Let me keep going. We are, and I'm going to read it from mine. It says, we are destroying speculations. And every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking, taking, what is that? That's an intentional act. Every thought captive. What does that mean? I'm making it a prisoner. To the obedience of Christ. What is that? The knowledge of who Christ is. If it don't line up, then I'm going to put it under that. No, nope, no. Nope. You're going to be right there. I'm going to put my foot on you. That's where you're going to stay. Right? What? And we are ready to punish all disobedience. Whenever your obedience is what? Verse 7, you are looking at things, what? Before your eyes. Before your eyes. That's where, that's where most of our problems come from. We're looking at what we see and not who we know. Mm -hmm. So if anyone has taught himself that he is in Christ, let him consider this again with himself, that just as he is in Christ, so also are we. Mm -hmm. So what? Paul was dealing with some issues. They were trying to come against him, and they were speaking lies about him and his ministry. Paul said, I'll address that. I'll take care of that. He said later on, he says, I'll come back to you and I'll show you with power. We'll find out who the apostles are. We'll find out who the ones who speak the truth are. What? Because I'm going to bring a demonstration of power. Let's see what they got. Paul wasn't just going to come at them with words. Why? Because we can argue words all day long. We see it on social media all the time. Pastors arguing with pastors and debating with pastors. What? You're getting into arguments and things. And Paul said, don't get caught up in those things. It doesn't lead to godliness. It leads actually to divisions and dissensions and actually pulls people away from Christ because you people want to sit up here and argue about stupid things that don't matter. Because what? They have strongholds. They've built up imaginations. They've built up ways of thinking. They've built up ways of believing that, one, don't line up to Scripture. But they have reinforced that thing so much, it's pretty much impenetrable. So what do you do? Now, because that's built up, I have to build a stronghold around that of truth. So I can't tear it down necessarily, but what I can do now is wrap it up with so much truth that this thing doesn't even have an effect anymore. That's how you will change a stronghold in your life. You start wrapping that thing with truth, and it will no longer have the ability to speak into your life. It will no longer have the ability to impact you the way that it has been impacting you. Why? Because you're bringing it under the authority of Christ. Mm -hmm. You're taking the lie. You're putting it under truth. Under. Not side by side. That's what people want to try to do. No. You put that lie under the truth and you kill it but what happens with like plants and stuff when you start covering them up you take away their source of thriving they die no difference with a lie you take its ability to be fed you take its ability to receive it will die and sooner or later all you will begin to see is truth and you'll be able to pick up a lie that fast you'll begin to hear it you'll start itching like nope 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 we gotta get away from that that's a lie I'm not gonna receive it mm -hmm. what does that mean well, whoever I hang out with, they're speaking lies, and they can, I'm going to have to walk away. Why? Because I spent time renewing my mind, just as we read earlier. I'm not going to allow you to unrenew my mind according to lies. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to allow you to rebuild a stronghold that I've been covering in truth. It's not going to happen. What does that mean? You may have to walk away from some things. Again, it's discipleship anyway. You may have to change your friend group. You may have to change your social group. Right? Because, again, sometimes we're social. They may not be friends, but we are social. Does that make sense? You may have to change content that comes through that or comes through this. Because more people are using this now anyway than TV. But you may have to change that. You may have to change religious content. Hear me. Because everything that comes across to Christian radio and Christian whatever is not Bible. They mean well, but it's not Scripture. So what do we do? We love them, but we get into the Bible and figure it out for ourselves. I don't take what anybody says for anything. Why? They may mean well, but I'm going to go back to Scripture. I'm going to find out, hey, does that say what that says? Why do I give you so much Scripture? You can take it up with God, not me. 
I'm just reading, most of the time, I'm just reading what it says. I have the easiest job in the world. I read the Bible. And I share it with you. What? I just reread the Bible out loud. Yeah. <laughs> That's really all I'm doing. Did I really do anything different than that this morning? Or did I just read the scripture to you? And I told you what? It says what it says. Just agree with it. If you'll agree with what the Bible says, it'll go a whole lot easier for you. And you will start seeing God move in your life. You will see amazing things happen in your life when you do that. But the choice is yours. It is completely, the ball is in your court. What will you do with it today? Because again, today is the day of salvation. And several times in scripture it actually says, hear today what the Spirit is saying. What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you this morning? Because again, he has the ability to take what I'm sharing and speak directly to something you have going on. That's the cool thing about the Holy Spirit. He will speak to you directly. What is he saying to you? Second question. What are you going to do about what he's saying to you? Because change will not begin until you make a decision to change. It's there. It's possible. It's available. But until you decide to actually do something with it, nothing's going to change. I want you to be with Jesus. And I want him to be in you, operating in you, operating through you to the point where people get around you like, God, man, you're just, all you're talking about is Jesus. Yes. That's, right. That's the only thing of value. Well, what about that? It's good. It's just not the same. For me, there's certain things now in my life I'm like, yeah. it's like I've completely lost interest in so many things. Why? Because it just it doesn't build up. It doesn't encourage. It doesn't strengthen. It doesn't point to Jesus. Why? Because I love Jesus. I love you guys, but I love Jesus more. I love my wife. I love my kids, but I love Jesus more. Because if I don't love him more, I really can't love them. It's that simple. If I don't love Jesus the rightly, I'll never have them in the right position. And they'll never see the love of Christ come through me. They'll see the world. They'll see society. But they won't see Jesus. We need to see Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Then we're going to worship.